Cathedral and welcome to today's Sunday celebration service. I just wanted to remind you that Kingdom Girls registration is officially closed, but we still have space for volunteers. So you can visit our website, ehconline.org, click the events tab and go under Kingdom Girls and you can register to volunteer. I also wanted to remind you that Kingdom Boys registration for their summer camp is still open. Registration goes until Sunday, July 17th and camp will take place from August 8th to August 12th. Price is just $150 for the camp. For more information, you can visit our website for that as well. Now join us as we worship the King of Glory. Good morning, Eagle Heights Cathedral. Let's stand to our feet, put our hands together and give God some praise today.
Praise the Lord, people of God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. Amen. Well, we have praised him with our song and testimonies. And now it's time to praise God with our treasure. And the church said, amen. 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 With a little help, they said, amen. So it's time to give testimony to our faith with our giving. You know, many times we have right in our hands what God wants to press into service for the kingdom. Amen. We see it over and over in the Bible. Remember, there was a boy that had two fish and five barley loaves. Didn't seem like enough, but the Bible says it fed 5,000. Samson used the jawbone of a donkey and killed a thousand enemy. David had a slingshot and five stones. He only needed one. The widow had some flour and a little bit of oil. And she fed the man of God, and then God took care of her throughout the famine. Moses stood on the banks of the Red Sea, Pharaoh's army behind and the, the water in front. And he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord reminded him that he had a staff in his hand, and it parted the Red Sea. You know, when we take what we have in our hand and give it to God and, and ask him to use it for the kingdom, who can tell what he'll do? Our special offering for this week is for missions. Missions is when we take what's in our hands and put it in service for God. Um, can I give you an example? Do we, do we have just want to show you a few pictures of what happens when you take what's in your hand and put it in service for God? Convoy of Hope is one of the missions ministries that we support. They're on the ground in Ukraine now, trying to help feed people who have been displaced, lost everything, not sure where their next meal's coming from, where they're going to sleep, how they're going to take care of their children. So I want to encourage you today that after you tithe, say that with me, after I tithe, <laughs> amen, praise God, then make an offering to missions, to convoy of hope. Let us give generously. Your tithe offering can make a difference in people's lives. Let's pray. Father, we give you glory and honor. We praise you, God. <laughs> There's nobody like you, God. And you've watched over us and kept us, God. And we're not in need, Lord God. But there are some that are. So, God, would you take a portion of what you've given us and let it press and help others in the name of Jesus. Amen.
worshiping God and I know that their bodies need healing but I don't focus on what they don't have I look at the fact that they're still breathing and as long as there's breath in their bodies there is an opportunity to see God do something great now listen to me if God's been better to you than you deserve today I want you to clap your hands open up your mouth and give him a hallelujah he hasn't heard yet because he's worthy to be praised. Well, bless him. Hallelujah. I was listening to a song this morning before I came into the house of God, an old song, Praise the Lord. And when you do, then the chains that seem to bind you fall powerless behind you when you praise him. Oh, that's so true. That's so true. 1 Timothy 3, beginning at verse 1. 1 Timothy 3, verse, verse 1. 1 Timothy 3. The Apostle Paul writes to this young preacher 
Verse 1, this is a faithful saying, if a man desire the position of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, temperate, sober-minded, and of good behavior, hospitable, able to teach, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not covetous, one who rules his own house well, having children in submission with all reverence. For if that man does not know how to rule his own house, how will he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, lest he be puffed up with pride, he fall into the same condemnation as the devil. Moreover, he must have a good, rep good testimony among the outside, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Father, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the reading of that word. Thank you for the preaching of the word. Because, Lord, that's where the power lies. It lies in your word. You said it will go forth. It will not return void. And I thank you for it, that it will do what you sent it to do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. A father said this, and I read it, and he said this. One of the rites of passage from boyhood to manhood is the first shave. The time between waiting to shave and needing to shave can be a matter of months for some kids, years for others. But there is something strongly symbolic in that first shave. I know the feeling. I have four sons. So you can imagine my thoughts of masculinity and accomplishment when I proudly watched my youngest son shave last week. This takes on greater significance when you realize that my youngest son is two years old. He wasn't shaving with a razor, but with a little black brush that came with the razor. It is the magic of a two-year-old. Last week, Joseph wandered into the bathroom just as I started to shave. He studied what I was doing, noticed the brush in the razor case, picked it up, and began shaving just like me. When I was shaving my right cheek, he shaved his right cheek. When I shaved around my mouth and chin, he did the same. He cocked his head the same way and squinted his eyes in the same way. He didn't miss a motion. But it goes beyond just mimicking a shave, doesn't it, dads? Those little guys look to you for many facets of manhood. You are their model. I am trying to think about it more often, like every time I shave. Every time I read that little story, it provokes several thoughts in me. The first thought is this. Fathers, please hear me. Even when we don't think about it, our kids are watching us. And I want to say something. Not only are our sons watching us, those that have sons, but your daughters are watching you because they're trying to find out what kind of man should they marry. The second thing is this. Every man is a male by virtue of nature and biology. I want to say something in love that is very important because I saw something that disturbed my spirit. You cannot be born a woman and become a man. I don't care how many surgeries you have. You cannot change biology. I said said that because one pastor paraded a woman who had trans uh, transgendered, quote unquote, into being a male, brought her on the platform and said, this is the bravest man in the house. There's a problem with that church. The third thing I want to say is this. While every man is male by virtue of biological birth, not every male is a man, though many refer to him as such. When it comes to the economy of God's kingdom and his word, just being born male does not qualify a male for manhood, for there is that which I call malehood to which every biological man is born into, and there is that which I call manhood, which, listen now, to which every male must matriculate into if indeed he is to become a male man. That being a male who goes from merely the stature and the stature of merely being a man by virtue of biology to that man by virtue of biblical precepts. Please understand this. When I use the word uh, matriculate, you look it up in the dictionary, it means to enroll in college or university for higher education. Matriculation. I looked in this book by Dondre Whitfield which I'm going to refer to quite often during this message. There's a book called Male Versus Man, and this young man, Dondre Woodfield, says this. If a man university existed, the class that would be taught to qualify a male for marriage, parenting and family life in general, would be Manhood 101. I can hear every woman reading this book take a breath of deep sigh of relief as she vigorously rubs her hands together in anticipation. And that's simply because for far too long, women have had to bear the infirmities of grown males who never matriculated into manhood. We're talking about maturity. Let me say it again. This pastor is tired of telling women of God, hold on daughter, God's got a man of God for you. God's got somebody who is mature to bring into your life, but that man never materializes. Listen now. And the truth be told, there are many women who are tired, tired to the point where they have accepted a belief that we have told them that is not true. Women have been told that you don't need 
need a man. Let me back that up and say, yes, women do need men. Women, you need us in your lives. But listen to what Dondre Whitfield goes on to say. One of the reasons you are so tired, my sister, is that you live in a world that tells you you don't need a man. Well, I want to correct that. You don't need another child to raise. Let me stop right here and say something. There is nothing more exasperating and loathing in the kingdom of God than a pouty man. Listen to me very closely. A man who thinks about everything and makes every decision according to whether it will benefit him or not. I, for one, am tired of men walking around the kingdom of God with their lips poked out six feet in front of them because they can't get to have their way. Let me tell you something. There is nothing more nauseating than a mopey, whiny, pouty man. Nothing irritates me more than a man who pouts because he drains the atmosphere, atmosphere of everything expectation and things that can bring joy to his family. Let me go back to Dondre Whitfield speaking to the sisters. Listen, single ladies, you don't need a grown male who depends on you to pay his bills. Now, if you're helping each other, that is another story, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the brother who lives in your house, eats your food, drives your car, and uses your gas. That dude is a straight fire starter, the kind who sets everything and everyone on fire based on his own benefits. This, is, this kind is what you have on your hands if you can't identify the difference between a male and a man. Now watch. Single mothers, please listen to me. If you are so desperate to have a man in your life, no matter how low level he is, please understand that you are going to create the very man of your son that Dondre just talked about. Watch this now. Unless you allow a man of God to speak life into your son's existence. And you may be asking, but hold on, Bishop. We are in God's house. We are men of God. Why are you talking to us this way? I'm going to tell you why. Several months ago, I told you about a young preacher and I told you about how he is a well-known TV preacher and there were people who used to come to this church who exalted what he said over what I preached in this house and then I told you about how he made a mess of his marriage and his ministry he had affairs and all kinds of other stuff that not only should a preacher not be doing but men should not be doing in fact and so the reason I'm rehearsing this story for you is that that preacher went on every medium available to him he went on me Media, and he began to publicly acknowledge how much he loved his wife because she stood by his side and covered him. And Christians applauded him. Listen to me. As he said, he made this statement that birthing him was more difficult for his wife than birthing their children. I would never even want to have that testimony. He was so thankful for how she stood by his side and covered him until he matriculated from a male into manhood, into a mailman. Listen to me, church. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, because Dondre is right about this. Ten years is too long to be a grown male's mother when you're supposed to be his wife. And there are signs all over that this man has not yet matriculated into manhood. Listen, please hear my heart and listen to me, ladies. It is not a woman's job to be broken and sad while the grown male in her life denies or too slowly acknowledges that he isn't fulfilling his manhood destiny. I'm talking about men growing up. I'm talking about us maturing to the place that the Apostle Paul spoke of in 1 Corinthians 13 and 11. Listen to what he said. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I acted like a child. I made all of my decisions based upon a childhood mentality. I walked around pouting and complaining because I was a little child. I made all kinds of immature decisions when I was a child. But listen to what he says next. But when I became a man... I put childhood ways behind me. Now listen to me, especially you single ladies. Dondre goes on to say that life is too short for you to be feeling depressed, stalking your guy, approaching other females about him. Don't ever do that again. Following him in your friend's car, going through his phone and his browser history. If you have to do that, then you have just acknowledged that you are probably not with a man. Now, he goes on to say, you may even be acknowledging that you are more female than woman. A lack of manhood causes great devastation, especially to the women who participate in that kind of behavior. Let me say something to all of us men. There has never been, there will never be, 
a man who comes out of his mother's womb, a male who is a man upon entering the earth. Please understand, we that have matriculated successfully from male to manhood, let me tell you something, we are ever still constantly on a journey of matriculation. Let me put it this way. Last week I was having lunch with Pastor Marcus and we got on this subject. And I turned to him and I said, you know, Pastor Marcus, we need to understand that this mailman thing, becoming a man of God, it is not a destination. It is a constant journey. And I said, I hope to God that Lady Brenda, I'm not the same man 40 years later that she married 40 years ago. I hope to God that I am a better man, listen to me, to matriculate from being simply that of male, of the male species into a male man. We have got to first of all understand men that that you will never ever be at the pinnacle of being a full and mature man lest you keep growing toward it. And let me say there's two things that we're going to have to do if we're going to mature men. Number one, matriculation from male to male man is a choice. We've got to make up our minds that we want to be men of God. We have got to dedicate ourselves to earning the title of man. Let me say something. Every man look at me. See, some of you men doing the same thing they did in the first service. All the women are paying attention. All the men suddenly are... Well, remember this, heat goes up and comes down. This word's going to land on your heart if you'll receive it. Just because your mother, when you came out of her womb and she saw your nice little soft, warm buns and said to you, the Lord hath blessed me. He hath given to me a male child. Listen to me very closely. Just because you came out of as a male, it does not give you the right to take up the title of a man. The title of a man has got to be earned. We don't assume it. We earn it. It is not freely endowed. We stand up and we allow the spirit to make us into men of God. And secondly, if we're going to mature, listen to me now. You must be and remain teachable. Let me tell you something. Some of the most unteachable people I've ever met are the ones who instantaneously tell me I'm teachable. Let me say something. Let me tell you how we're going to learn to be teachable. The way you know you are teachable, men and women, please look at me, is when you eliminate a little three-letter word from your vocabulary. Everybody say, but. When you get butt out of your vocabulary, and I ain't talking about the one you sit on. Listen to me very closely. I'm talking about if you will get butt out of your vocabulary, you'll be able to be corrected and directed. Well, you know, Bishop, I know you're right, but I hear what you're saying, but I know that you know what you're talking about, but you know I'm hearing you, but you don't know what I've been through, but, 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 but. Everybody listen to me. Do we understand that too many people confuse receiving information with being teachable. You and I are not teachable until it changes our behavior, until that you, listen, if all you do is get information, all you've do, done is come in contact with information because when we receive information, it will transform our behavior. And let me tell you something. Men, if we're going to mature, we must not have that know-it-all attitude. We got to get butt out of our big vocabulary. Read my Pentecostal lips, but nothing. Goats butt. Why do goats butt? Because they're hard-headed and stubborn. Woo-hoo. Silence is golden. Let me tell you something. To matriculate from merely a male existence to that of a male man, we are going to have to always be open up and open up ourselves to receiving and learning. So let's receive and let's learn, men. Let's take the word of God and take it into here. And don't get mad at dad. Be glad. Eat the word. And then we talked about what wars against the maturity of the male man. Then we began to talk about Paul's profile of a male man. And I want to say this again, that those are the things that he said that a bishop should do. But every man ought to have the attitude of a bishop. Now watch this. We said that number one, a true male man seeks to live a blameless life. A true male man, number two, is the husband of one wife. Thirdly, a true male man is temperate. The fourth thing we talked about is a true male, male man is sober-minded. Now, on number five, I talked to you about a true man, male man is a good behavior. He's a good role model. Let me stop and say something before I move on to the last two points. I want to make something very, very clear in this room today. When I use my favorite baseball player, Derek Jeter, as an illustration, 
I was not speaking of the Derek Jeter of today. Derek Jeter today is a married man, and as far as I know, he is faithful to his wife. But the reason that I gave you that illustration is this. I have more concern for we preachers who are always parading somebody up on this this platform, and we're talking about them being a role model just because they make millions of dollars a year, and we put them up here and act like there's somebody to emulate. Let me tell you something. I would rather pull a Deacon Reuben out of this congregation. I would rather pull one of, the, uh, uh, one of our young men out of this congregation and put them on this platform who I know is living a godly life, who is taking care of their wife and their children, than to put somebody on this platform just because they make millions of dollars when they are not a great example of what a role model should be and we have got to stop exalting people in the world and start lifting up men of God who have normal lives but are living like Jesus and my point was to illustrate how dangerous and selfish it is when a man does not exercise self-control again Proverbs 25 and 28 a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls I want to ask a question men how can we protect something when everything is running wild in our lives who are we going to cover Please understand something. It is time for young men, single men, to quit being controlled by your sex expectations and start being controlled by the expectation of the Holy Ghost who lives on the inside of you. And so number six, a true male man is hospitable. 1 Timothy 3, 2F. That means he's unselfish and generous. Now I'm going to come about this from a different direction than what we're used to. A true male man is generous in four areas of his life. Let me give you the first three. The first three are time, talent, and touch. Time, talent, and touch. Time, talent, and touch. We don't talk much about touch, so I'm going to show you how all three of these go together today. The story is told that a little boy watched his dad leave for a business trip, and he figured that now he was in charge. He had two sisters, so he announced to them after his father left that he was now head of the family. That night at dinner, he decided to sit in his dad's chair. His mother was so impressed that she decided to give him permission to sit in his dad's chair at the table. Well, his sisters didn't like that one bit. They reminded that boy that he was not their father and that he really didn't know what he was doing. One of the sisters decided to corner the brother. She said, if you're going to take dad's place, then we'll present you with a problem. She manufactured a family problem and then asked him what he would do about it. The boy sat and he thought about it for a minute and then he said, I'm going to do what dad would do. I'm going to ask your mother. Mm -hmm. That little story carries a not so obvious truth about manhood. Listen to me, men. We are living in a day and a time in many cases where the environment for a lot of young men today due to the reality of an absentee father and for many reasons where many a young person comes out of an environment and into an environment that would like them to be responsible and strong enough to be a man. But what we don't understand to act like a man when the fact of the matter is that at their age and where they are in life, they don't have the necessary skills to do so. In his book, Dondre Whitfield brings forth some hard truths. He says these young men sometimes come from backgrounds where the father is missing or inactive in the home and a man's supplement is needed. The pressure to act like a man can cause that kind of trauma to a boy that scars him and scares him out of getting pre prepared to be a man. Listen to me. He says, when a boy is told he is a man of the house, which is the acronym MOTH, simply because no other males are present, it is often confusing and frustrating. Let me say something. The other day, I was thanking God for the home that I grew up in. I was thanking God for my father. I was thanking God that my imperfect father was a man of God. And I was thanking God for the reality that my father was what a father should be. And then I began to remember my my friends whose fathers either passed away in our youth or the father was in the house physically but he was not there emotionally and so my friends had to step into the moth title because no other male was present listen to me and let me tell you what happened to them many of them never recovered from that one of my friends in high school whose father died when he was a small child thank God he had a strong mother and she raised him up as a man of God and he grew into manhood 
But he called me up one day because he's in the ministry as well. And there was a course of time, a period of time, where five or six of my classmates all died within a row. And he called me up and he said, we've lost another one. We're losing them way too fast. Everybody listen to me. Every one of those people that died had two things in common. They either drank or drugged their life away. And the second thing was that there was no man of value who invested in their lives. Listen now. I never really thought about this until I read that book. And I began to see that many of my friends had been given a title and an expectation that they did not possess the skill sets to fulfill. As the moth, they were devoid of power to make any key decisions about the direction of the household. They didn't have the tools to formulate them, and they were frequently chastised by their female parents. Many of my friends were left feeling powerless in that place that they called home. Often they viewed the woman of the house as someone they would battle and not partnership with. Listen to this now. He says this is a common phenomenon that rarely gets examined. The moth is assigned to a house that will burn him due to the flames. The fires that often up, that flare up in unbalanced households. His mother dubbed him a man, but will shame him for not performing like one in the hopes that it will activate him to become one. Rarely does it ever happen. It leaves many of our brothers feeling as though they will never be able to live up to the title of man because no one ever explained that manhood isn't an age or a title that someone gives you to fulfill and fill a void. Rather, it is a collection of skill sets and dedication to service. Listen to me, men. What I really remember when I look back over my life and it wasn't a perfect home and it wasn't a, a perfect childhood, but it was a blessed childhood. And I am so thankful that I got the opportunity to really grow up at the speed that a young man should grow up. And because I was allowed to do that, I began to observe my father and my uncles and I was able to grow because they were in my life. And let me tell you something I know about my daddy, 90 years old. He is the best picture I have ever seen of what my heavenly father looks like. He is a father who showed me how to mature from a young man into a young adult, a father who corrected me. And because I listened to him and a lot of my friends didn't have that. And I think about two of my cousins who both spent 10 years in prison because their fathers passed away when they were little children and no man spoke into their lives. See, when a boys are forced to abandon their boyhood because they've been told to act like a man, they simply become actors and pretenders in the ways of manhood. Listen to me. A grown male and a man are polar opposites. They are like magnets with the same pole that repel and oppose each other. A male who is grown is stuck in the mentality of a boy and generally looks to be served. A man, simply put, is a male who generally looks to be of service. Look at me. I joke sometimes about men being 13-year-olds that are stuck in 20, 30-year-old bodies. But when you think about it, it's really not funny. Please understand this. I said all that to say this, even where there is no father in the house or where there is a father who is physically there but not emotionally and mentally, I want the men in this room to please zero in and focus with me today because I didn't come to give you a sermon so you can go and shout. I came to give you a message that I need your help in this church today. We need men of God who will rise up and get involved in the youth and the children's ministry. I need some men who will leave this place today and before you go out that door, you will grab Pastor Marcus and say, let me help you raise the young men and women in this youth group. I need some young men who will grab Pastor Mitchell and say, Pastor Mitchell, I'm going to fill the void where there are no men helping to raise our young men today. And you know what? There is a generation men that needs your time, your talent, and your touch. Well, Bishop, that's just it. It takes time. I don't have much time. Well, welcome to the club. I know it takes time. But hear me. Time is an issue for all of us. 
But I want us to understand that when a man puts God's agenda as his priority, it's mighty funny how God turns around and he helps him to achieve his priorities. Hear me. I'm going to say it again. A male seeks to be served. A man seeks to be of service. And let me stop and say something. Where, 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 where is Travis? Is, is Travis here? See, okay. Now this is going to prove my point. This young man is a master guitarist. You ever notice I look over there and just grin every time he starts doing that thing? Remember that movie, The Thing You Do. Let me tell you something. He goes from here to there if we need him, to there if we need him, many times because his wife is taking care of herself physically because of, of a child, he is here taking care of business in God's house. He takes his time from home. He brings it to the house of God. He never makes an excuse because he understands, listen now, if I put God's priority and his agenda first, he will fulfill mine. Now watch this. Males seek to be served. A man seeks to be of service. And those of the latter understand that a true male man is a standard barrier. He is one who covers every woman and child in his life. And one of the ways is by touching and teaching the generations that will follow, especially young men, hear the Holy Spirit. A true male man understands that this that I speak of, we don't just cover the women in our purview. I don't just cover Lady Brenda and Jessica and Shauna. We understand that we are a walking tree that provides cover for all of the elements of the world that bring harm to this village and our tribe and our daily mission now is to choose service over self and deny flesh. Because men, hear me, flesh is always trying to derail us from standing in the gap like God called us to. I've said this time and time again over the years, even if a man is not the blame for a problem, everything is not our fault, men. Please understand that. But a true male man is willing to take responsibility for addressing and for healing the things that need his time, talent, and touch to cover it. And I'm praying again, God, raise up some men in this kingdom and that they not leave this place today. Every man, quit looking back there and look at me. Please understand this. Every man, do not leave this place, but that you let the the Holy Spirit speak to you and you find a place to serve. Talk to Pastor Marcus. Talk to Pastor Mitchell. Say, let me help you. I was watching this special on TV about a herd of young male elephants that were running wild. They were running over trees, fighting each other and creating havoc in their environment. They were male elephants gone wild. And experts were trying to figure out what was happening, and finally they noticed that there were no adult male in the herd. There were all teenage elephants that had lost their natural mind. The reason there were not adult elephants is that poachers had come in and killed them for the ivory. So in an attempt to fix the problem, they flew in a group of male adult elephants and they dropped them into the herd. When those male elephants dropped into the midst of the chaos, look at me now, listen now, they began flapping their ears, raising their trunks, and making these loud sounds. After a few days of flapping their ears, raising their trunks, and making these sounds, the teenage elephants all calmed down. As long as the teenage elephants were calling their own shots, you had gangs of elephants that had gone crazy because of a lack of discipline. But when the adult male elephants dropped in and flapped their ears and raised their trunks and made the sound, they commanded and demanded order. Listen to me. We've got some teen terrorists today because there are no adult male elephants in their midst. We need a generation of adult male elephants, if you will. I'm talking about real men who will, who will raise their trunk and they will sound the truth of what a man really looks like. And I'm telling you right now, we are not going to calm down this generation who doesn't know how to act until we understand that most of them are the way they are 
because they've never seen male elephants in their midst. Let me tell you about a guy named Bill. Bill was one of my youth workers in East Hartford, Connecticut for nearly seven years. Every man listen to me. He worked for Pratt and Whitney in East Hartford. He was a big deal. He was one of the main guys there. But let me tell you about Bill and his wife. For nearly seven years, they were at every youth activity that I ever did, and we did them every other week. We didn't do like youth pastors do today. If they do one activity a month, they think that they've conquered the world. We did a youth activity every other week. Every youth camp, one week a year, he would take his vacation and he would go with us to youth camp. Every youth convention, one weekend a year, every year, he would take a whole weekend off. Every youth monthly meeting, once a month, he was there at those meetings and listened to me. That's the way it was when I was in Worcester, too. Every man that worked with me, they were there. I'm talking about 30 years ago. You to this day still call us up. They are adults and have their own children, and they don't just talk about us, me and Lady Brenda. They talk about the men who invested in their lives. There was one guy who used to beat up his father physically. He's now a missionary. He's got his own family. Not just because of me and Lady Brenda, but because men invested in his life. Listen now. I told you I had four of them. Here's the fourth thing that men that we need to give. Not only our time, our talent, and our touch, we need to give God our treasure. Let me tell you something. A true male man of God does not have to be forced to sow seed into the kingdom. No one has to twist his arm to obey God in tithes and offerings. Let me say something. If you can buy yourself expensive stuff, but you can't give God anything, let me just not be the nice preacher today, then you are living in sin. Let me just say it. You are not living a godly life. Now watch this. We cannot talk to young men about service and giving what we are not leading the way in. There's a story about a hog and a hen that were sharing the same barnyard. They heard about a church's program to feed the hungry. The hog and the hen discussed how they could help. The hen said, I've got it. We'll provide bacon and eggs for the church to feed the hungry. The hog thought about the suggestion for a moment and he said, there's a problem with your bacon and egg solution. For you, it only requ requires a contribution, but for me, it will mean commitment. Mm. <laughs> Listen, church, you are not truly committed to the cause of Christ until we obey him by leading in the way in our families and putting God first. Let me just stop and say this. There is a single mother in this church who paid the bulk of the money for you to sit in this air conditioning today and enjoy it. Now, why am I telling you this? Because it's not the first time she's done that. It's not the second. It's not the third. It's not the fifth. I can't tell you how many times she has done that. And people say, how is she getting blessed the way she's getting blessed? I'll tell you how. Because you need to understand, when you make God's toast, God's house your priority, he'll take care of your house. Let me just say this. One more time, we have got to learn, men, we have got to learn that God does not want equal gifts, but he wants equal gifts equal sacrifice. God is quiet. But we got a whole generation of young men going to hell because we men are standing back. Number seven, this will help you so you'll get over what I just said. A true male man is able to teach. 1 Timothy 3, 2G, speaking the truth in love. The male man speaks the truth in love, not just because he's telling the truth, but he speaks the truth because he loves people. And sometimes the truth can be painful for the moment, but when it is received, it turns out to salvation. And let me say something. Some of you are having the trouble that you're having with your children because you were too busy trying to be their friend than to be their parents and tell them the truth. So turn it around. Stop and turn it around. Lady Brenda and I constantly told Jessica and Shauna, I love you, but let me tell you something. You will not be my friend until you are an adult, and even then, I'm still your daddy. Parents, listen to me. Quit talking to your kids like they're your best friend. 
Quit letting them run your house. I'm not trying to hurt. I'm trying to help. Listen to me. When truth is received, it'll save lives. The Betty Ford Center, which is a treatment for center for those with substance abuse dependence, was opened on October 4, 1982. Let me tell you what the catalyst was for its birthing. Years ago, Betty Ford, that story aired on the television. This was a movie that told the story of Betty Ford's addiction and recovery. For those of you who don't know who Betty Ford was, she was the wife of our 38th president, Gerald Ford. She had been taking opioid analgesics for pain since the 1960s. Her dependency on those drugs had dissipated during her time in the White House. But after leaving Washington, D.C., her drinking increased, as did her prescription drugs. So in 1978, the Ford family staged an intervention, and they forced Betty to confront her addiction to alcohol and pain pills. At a point during the movie, there's this emotional scene, and all of a sudden, the family is sitting around, and they're confronting Betty Ford, and her son turns to her and he says mother you are destroying yourself you are destroying this family and you are killing yourself mother you are a drunk you are an addict the mother is infuriated she told her son that he was being very disrespectful she questioned his right to speak to her that way and she said how can you say these things to me I'm your mother listen to what the son said mother I can say it because it's the truth now, everybody listen to me. Men, listen to me. Because she took the truth, she dealt with it. It ended up saving hundreds and hundreds of lives of people that were hooked on drugs. Men, listen to me. The things I have said today have been very hard to swallow. They have been difficult. But let me tell you something. The truth spoken in love, if you will take it, you will be used of God to save hundreds and hundreds of lives. Because listen to me, men, we have no right to speak to anything that we're not first doing. Come on. That's where our authority is. My authority is, is not what I say alone it's what i do because remember this you talk talk but your walk talks more than your talk talks so whatever you're going to do do it for the glory of god now let me get to the place that most of y'all are hoping i get to here's the conclusion of the matter <laughs> number one men of spiritual maturity are pursuing the heart of god we constantly Philippians 3 and 12, Paul says, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Number two, a true male man understands there's no maturation without the word of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, all scripture is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Every man, listen to me. You cannot equivocate on the word of God. You cannot try and twist it like a pretzel to fit what you want it to fit. We must take the word of God, and if God says it, we must receive it. Look at me for a minute. Let me tell you what happens when I'm preaching. Just like today, many times what happens when I'm preaching, the Holy Spirit is talking to me. So I can't say it to you, but I'm going, really, God? Are you serious? That hurts. But I know if I receive it, because God said it. Number three. There is a price to be paid in order to become a true male man. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. That is the goal. If you're going to be like Jesus, who is the perfect example of what a male man is, then you and I have got to understand that we have got to pay the price. Now, let me close with this. Some people participate in a scam due to a major event, such as a banquet or a ceremony. They'll go to the store. They'll buy a dress or a suit or some shoes to wear. They will adorn themselves with the outfit for the event only to go back to the store the next day to return it. That is their intent from the beginning. Now, some of you are going to say, he's talking about me. <laughs> You've seen them. The tag pops out the back of the dress. The guy goes into the bathroom, switches shoes, pulls out some soap and some water, and tries to scrub the shoes clean that he wore to the banquet. 
Maybe you're the one that the tag popped out on. They never intend to buy these things don't to own them. They only want to use the goods for their own purposes and then give them back. Where the store intends to make legitimate sales to legitimate customers. The customers in this situation actually have an entirely different plan in mind. Listen to me. They have a game in mind. They are running a game on the establishment. So let me talk to all of us, and especially men. Many of us are attempting to run a game on God. Let me talk to you. We come to the store, the church. We stand before others. We stand here on New Year's Eve night. We become a member of the church, making certain promises to serve God in certain ways, and we say what we want and what we're committed to. We make declarations regarding what we want and what we would do for God. But watch now. We take for our own purposes what we want from the establishment, only to later tell God that we can't be of use to him. And we don't want his work and his will anymore. We tell God we want him and that we are here for his purposes. And then at our convenience, we live our lives for our own fulfillment and purposes. Please hear my heart to your heart from the heart of God. Because I sat down last night, and I didn't want to say this, but God said, tell my people to quit running a scam on me. The difference is that unlike the establishment owners with God, we can't run a game because he has the ability to search our heart. See, when we do that, then here is what comes from the heart and the voice of Jesus, Matthew 15 and 8. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Why am I being so hard today? Because it's time for kingdom men to arise. I mean spiritually and physically. It's time for us to start doing something for the glory of God and then quit quitting when we start. I know you've got a life. I know some of you have been through some serious stuff. But it's time to quit, quit, quit excusing ourselves. We've got husbands running out on their children and their spouses when things get too tough. Time to grow up. We've got Parents giving up on their children because they're not doing what we want them to do right now. It's time to grow up. We've got preachers going in the pulpit saying that God called them and he placed them in a place of ministry and yet the first sign of struggle and they run away. Grow up. We got to get ourselves together, men. Spirit, soul, and body. Deacon Reuben, come join me on this platform. Ramon, come join me on this platform. Pastor Kevin, come join me on this platform. Deacon Reuben, Reuben, just stand right there. Pastor Kevin, just stand where you stood last time. Ramon, just go stand right over there. I'm going to show you why many times we can't get ourselves together, men. And listen to what I'm about to say. There is not enough prayer that will set you free if you don't pay attention to what I'm about to say. You can go to a multitude of counselors. You can come to this altar. We can dip you in olive oil. I can rub a dub you, lay hands on you, spit in your face and say be healed. And it ain't going to do you no good if you don't understand this. This is spirit. This is soul. This is body. And we learned in this church how most of us Christians operate. Now listen to what I'm about to say. I'm talking about most of us. It doesn't mean you don't love God, but let me tell you how most of us operate. Soul goes over here. Spirit goes down here. And body gets right here. And so we spend our lives being led by this fellow 
Watch now. And what does the soul do? What does this fellow do? He looks at the body and he says, hey, what would you like? What would you like? And the body does what the body does. It's flesh. The flesh desires the things of the flesh. And so the flesh tells the spirit, or tells the soul, here's what I want. And you know what the soul says? Well, yeah, my brother, I'm going to go get it for you. Now, that body can never submit to God because it's constantly under the control of this, the soul. How do we correct it? Well, soul has got to understand that the reason that you behave the way you behave is because you're wounded. You got to be healed. Because what is the soul? It is the place of your will, your emotions, your thoughts. And so the soul is always looking to be admired, to be taken care of. And the way to do it is to talk to the body because the soul feels good when it gets the body what it wants. But the soul keeps us from serving God. So what has to happen? The soul's got to get itself taken care of. And when he does, he slides over here. Then what happens? The body says, I'm not getting anything else out of him. He slides back down here. And then the spirit comes back to the place where God first created him to be. We are first spirit, soul, and body. And then what happens when the spirit is back where he belongs? Guess what? The spirit does not look at the body and say, what do you want? The spirit looks down there and says, follow me as I follow Christ. Go walk down there, Deacon Reuben, walk around and go back and leave these guys back to their seats. This is how we're supposed to operate. Spirit. Soul, body, spirit, soul, body. But we struggle because, and we've all been there, done it. If you don't get healing to your soul, man, you'll never ever finally step back and say, I want to serve the Lord. And here's what some of you are banking on. Well, you know, Bishop, right now my life's a mess. When I get my life together, then I'm going to serve the Lord. Good luck. <laughs> Let me tell you something. God men, if you will obey him and you will begin to serve, he will heal you as you go. If I had to wait till I was totally whole to stand in a pulpit, never would have happened. Because I'm not the, I was not the wonderful product you see today. I was selfish, even when I married that woman. Not in big ways, but in many ways. And sometimes that guy tries to show up sometime again. Forty years later, he still tries to show up. But you know what? As I've grown in the Lord, I can see him when he's coming. And I say, no, 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 no. Get back where you belong so I can lead by spirit, then soul. Because you know a funny thing happens when you get your soul healed? All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit's voice becomes the dominant voice that you hear. His voice becomes clearer. You don't, the, the moment you start stepping, men, where you shouldn't be stepping, he kicks in. Listen. That's why I say every day, God, sanctify my eyes. Because if you can get your eyes straight it'll take care of the rest of you now I know that Jessica's going to sing well, glory to God she's going to sing from the back which further proves my point she needs physical healing but she didn't go down there in her office and say I can't help Lead us, Jessica. 
the number one reason why I serve the Lord. Because he's been better to me than I've been to myself. Everything I've got, whether it's in the spirit or in the natural realm, it's because he's been good to me. And how can I dare sit on a good God? Now, let me tell you men what really gets in our way. Paul said, it was John, I believe, that said the lust of the eyes. And he said something very important. The pride of life. Men, pride gets in our way. Let me tell you how I know. My father, who became a pastor, a preacher, before my oldest brother came into the earth, when my mother met him, I want to tell you about him, he was a prideful man. I mean, so prideful he would smoke nothing but the most expensive cigars he could find. My father was so prideful, he would climb up on top of the bed and put his suit pants on because he didn't want any lint to possibly get around the bottom of his cuff. One time my mother, when they were dating, went to take lint off his jacket. He slapped her hand and said, don't touch my jacket. Full of pride. And then one day, <laughs> don't ever run into the Holy Ghost. He had on one of those expensive suits in an old church with a dusty floor. 
God cleaned the floor with him in that suit. And when he got up, pride was released from his life. And he said, God, I'll do what you want me to do. Why? Because you've been better to me than I've been to myself. You've been better than good to me. You've been better than good. Come on, y'all. You've been better than good. Now, I am confident that some of you men, when you leave this place, after all of us get over our little bruised egos, that some of you are going to say, God, use me. Use me to touch a generation. Because listen to me, too many Christians thought, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to anyway. Let me tell you why I'm going to say it. Because like I said, you'll never know who I vote for. But let me tell you what I want to tell you. Some of y'all and a whole lot of us, we got to get rid of Donald Trump. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. And all of these people, now that they got what they want, they don't want what they got. <laughs> Come on, somebody. <laughs> Let me tell you why. At the end of the day, it's got nothing to do with whether Donald Trump is bad or good, whether President Biden is bad or good. It's got everything to do with, I'm going to say it one more time, the church did not learn what God tried to tell us during COVID. And so God says, I'm going to keep on taking you through the same lessons until you pass the test. Mm hmm I love it. I can always tell when somebody don't like what I'm saying. Because they start mumbling and don't even know they're mumbling. But I can see their lips moving. It's kind of like, how do you know when somebody's lying? Their lips are moving. Listen to me. I'm going to say it again. Church, pray who to vote for. But then after you've done that, Quit running around thinking, oh, we got the right man now. We're never going to have the right man unless we understand that we got the right man on our side. His name is Jesus. Amen? Amen. So, do me a favor. Go home and enjoy your 4th of July. Laugh, have fun, recover from this word and come back next Sunday and give it one more try. Amen. Amen. Like I said, the only people looking at me like they're mad is the ones who ain't going to do nothing. It's all right. Lift up your holy hands. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you is peace. Eagle Heights Cathedral, it has been so great to worship with you once again. I want to remind you to check our website, ehconline.org, and click the events tab, and follow us on Facebook and Instagram to stay updated on our upcoming events and activities. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday.